Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship for Sunday, April 29th, 2018. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we are so glad that you have chosen to join us this morning. Uh, those of you who are brand new to the fellowship, and we're, uh, we know that there are a few of you out there, we want to welcome you and, and let you know that we, we we do this in a chronological reading order, so mm-hmm. if you're sort of puzzled as to why we jump around, even though lately we've been pretty much concentrating on Ezekiel. Right. Uh, we do jump around because it's in the order in which it was written, and uh, sorry, the order in which it occurred, and right. it, yeah. it's pretty awesome that way. Yeah, the uh, when, when you uh, juxtapose, to use a you know, yeah. multi-syllable oh, word, yeah. yeah, early on a Sunday morning for using more than ah. two syllables, um, juxtapose some of the Psalms with uh, the life of David, then you get a better understanding of what was in his mind when he wrote those Psalms, which is really uh, interesting. But also seeing that, um, going back further to Genesis, you get through the first 10 chapters, get through the story of Nimrod, and then suddenly you jump over to Job. Well, mm-hmm. Job lived probably before Abraham. Yeah, it's it's really and, cool uh, to do it that way. Yeah. By the way, we also use the English Standard Version, the ESV, simply because it's a good word-for-word translation that mm-hmm. Mike Heiser recommended to us long yeah. ago, but we are not sold on that being the only version. No, no. We use a lot of them. Yeah, there are a number of excellent translations, and uh, each one has strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, Young's literal, I like it too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, There are those who swear by the Geneva Bible, which Mm -hmm. is the Bible that the pilgrims would have used because the King James wasn't uh, available in the U.S. yet. Uh, well, it wasn't, even, it wasn't even available. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, 1622, if it was uh, released in 1611. I mean, 1622 is when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth. So, it, but they hadn't had access to it before they got over here. Oh yeah, that's true. That's so, true. Uh, and and you know, there's a little thing called the American Revolution. There were uh, stuff that was you know required had, was under Crown copyright was not really welcome here in the colony. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, the ESV, the Net Bible has its uh, advantages, uh, mainly the translators' notes because the Net uh, translators uh, they published all their notes, so you can see why they chose what they chose. And, uh, um, and by the it, way, the Net Bible is not the Internet; it's the New no, English no, Translation. New English Translation, yeah. They just just like the Web Bible is the World English Bible. It's not uh, again. They just hey, this Web thing I, might catch cool. on. Let's, so let's use it. Yeah. Well, it conveys a kind of an incorrect sense. It's not an electronic know, Bible, exactly. Uh, although you can find it online. But anyway, the, the point is, uh, as the translators of the King James Bible wrote 500 years ago, um, having access to multiple translations it give, it is, is helpful to getting a better understanding of the Word of God. We choose the ESV, again, because it's a good word-for-word translation in a more modern English, as opposed to, the, say, the NIV, which is thought-for-thought. Thought. But Mike also says this, and I think this is wise. The best Bible translation is the one that you're going to read. Mm-hmm. Pick yeah. up one and read. And the King James translator said that too. Even the meanest, in other words, even the poorest English translations is still the Word of God. Yeah. So, uh, and, and we like to go back to it because we believe it's an errant in the original language. Right. Perfect in the original language. Exactly. Yeah. The, the translations aren't always correct, especially if it, you have to take a word that's only used once. Yeah. There are, well, going back to Job, Job has some archaic phrases and terms that uh, don't appear anywhere else in the Bible. And so it's difficult for modern translators, you know, 6,000 years after the fact, 4,000, well, 5,000 years after the fact, probably, to um, understand what was exactly precisely intended, because uh, English and Hebrew don't have a one-to-one correlation either. There are characters and sounds in Hebrew that don't exist in English, yeah. which is how we get uh, Har Moed into Armageddon. Yeah. There's no G sound in the word originally, but we put one in because that's the closest thing we <laughs> English speakers can come up with. Well, it made sense so, to me at yeah. the time. I mean, no, no, it yeah. doesn't. So, you ought to read Derek's book, The Great Inception, to really get that. But Yeah, well, it's not original research to me, but I'm grateful for scholars who've, uh, who've proposed... Uh, the, the uh, solution to, to things mm-hmm. like that and, yeah. and how you get from one to the other. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. I, I, and speaking of, uh, the manuscript is almost done. Yay! Yay! And speaking of manuscript, Sharon's new book, n- uh, novel, uh, Realms of Stone, is now available. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that on today's yeah. PID Radio. Yeah, so 
we're going to get into the study here because we've only got this this week as we're getting ready to head to Israel next week before uh well, Before we, we'll we take be a gone week for three weeks. Yeah, we, we are under no illusion that we're going to be able to continue this study or regular PID radio broadcast while we're over there. We may be able to record some things, and that would be cool to do some stuff from Israel. Yeah, we'll try our best. Just to but, say that but this is from Israel. But that's not our job yeah. while we're over there, necessarily. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be really exciting. Um, so, shall we pray? Absolutely. Father, we thank you for bringing us together through this electronic medium to study your word. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you would open our hearts and our minds so that we understand it in the context that you transmitted it to the prophet. Help us to see the world through the eyes of Ezekiel to the best of our ability. Grant us wisdom, Lord, and discernment. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, because we're approaching some of the cool, cool stuff in uh, the book of Ezekiel, so we want to get there as fast as we can. Yeah, I know. Without well, skipping over anything. This has got so much yeah. good in it, this one. Ezekiel 23 is where we begin, and uh, yeah, he's uh, once again using a parable. Yeah, by the way, uh, if you see LORD in all caps, if you're mm-hmm. new to this, we always that is actually the representation of Yahweh. Yeah. They put it in all caps. So either the word God or Lord in all caps, that is Yahweh. So yeah. you'll hear us say Yahweh. And it's not that we believe that you need to use the name Yahweh in no. order for him to understand who you're talking to. It's easier it's than a, saying Lord all caps. It, it, exactly. Yeah. It, it distinguishes from the word Lord, which just feels kind of generic. I mean, we need to understand in the divine council worldview that there are more than one, there's more than one resident of the supernatural realm or more than just Two being God and Satan, there it's it's a fully it's it, it's it's a very but, but when the Lord with, refers yeah. to Himself as Yahweh, He's got a reason for that, and I like to make sure that that's included. Right, because right. that was how the prophets would have heard it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The word of Yahweh came to me, son of man. There were two women, the daughters of one mother. They played the whore in Egypt. They played the whore in their youth. There, their breasts were pressed and their virgin bosoms handled. Uh, again, God using Ezekiel to um, make a point and using very blunt language. You'd, mm-hmm. you'd almost say crude in well, order to make the point, which he did. We, we would call it crude, but honestly, that was just part of life. True, true. Uh, the, for for Let's say to our modern sensibilities, we would consider it crude. This yeah. is not the kind of thing you would expect to see a Bible hear from a Bible teacher on Sunday morning. No, exactly. But look at Psalm, Song of Solomon. It has language like that in, all mm-hmm, over. Mm-hmm. So that represents a pure relationship. Right. This it, one, not so much. It, exactly. And if you haven't guessed already, he's talking about the two kingdoms that split off from the sons of Jacob, Israel and Judah. Ohola was the name of the elder. That would be uh, the representation of uh, Israel. And Oholaba, the name of her sister. Actually, Ohola is Samaria. Well, Samaria, but that would be the northern kingdom of Israel. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. They, they called themselves Israel. After, yes. Yeah. But Samaria, correct. And, and Holobab, uh, which means... They both mean uh, of the tent or yeah. woman of the tent. Yeah. Which is uh, interesting because uh, that's how Yahweh was depicted until Solomon built the temple. He was living in a tent, which... Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Ohola was the name of the elder. Oholaba, the name of her sister. They became mine and they bore sons and daughters. As for their names, Ohola is Samaria, and Aholaba is Jerusalem, so the capital cities of the two kingdoms. Right. Ohola played the whore while she was mine, and she lusted after her lovers, the Assyrians, warriors clothed in purple, governors and commanders, all of them, desirable young men, horsemen riding on horses. Notice, even in the pre-Roman period, purple was the color of royalty. Mm-hmm. That's where the Phoenicians got their name, actually. Yeah, because it was an expensive dye to make. Right. You, you had to crush a lot of Murex snail shells to get that uh, purple dye. Uh, she bestowed her whoring upon them, the choicest men of Assyria, all of them. And she defiled herself with all the idols of everyone after whom she lusted. She did not give up her whoring that she began that she begun in Egypt. For in her youth, men had lain with her and handled her virgin bosom and poured out their whoring lust upon her. Therefore, I delivered her into, into the hands of her lovers, into the hands of the Assyrians after whom she lusted. These uncovered her nakedness. That's, just, again, a euphemism for mm-hmm. sexual impropriety. They seized her sons and her daughters, and as for her, they killed her with the sword. And she became a byword among women when judgment had been executed on her. 
Her sister Aholaba saw this, and she became more corrupt than her sister in her lust and in her whoring, which was worse than that of her sister. You know, that's really interesting because uh, the Jerusalem, especially in the time of Christ, they were so derogatory towards the Sumerians. Samaria. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Samaritans, yeah. Uh, who, by the way, still exist today. Small community, but they still, hmm. they're still there living in Israel. Um, is this one you or me? Uh, that one is you. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, well, verse 11, 11 again. again. Yeah. Her sister Aholabah saw this and she became more corrupt than her sister in her lust and in her whoring, which was worse than that of her sister. She lusted after the Assyrians, governors and commanders, warriors clothed in full armor, horsemen riding on horses, all of them desirable young men. And I saw that she was defiled. They both, they both took the same way. Both hmm. sisters. Yeah. Okay. But she carried her whoring further. She saw men portrayed on the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed in vermilion, wearing belts on their waists, with flowing turbans on their heads, all of them having the appearance of officers, a likeness of Babylonians whose native land was Chaldea. And just for reference, and this will I'll talk about this in my book, the Chaldeans' descendants of the Amorites. Mm -hmm. When she saw them, she lusted after them and sent messengers to them in Chaldea. And actually, this was something Hezekiah did. He was considered the good king. Look, look at all the treasures in our temple. Isn't mm -hmm. this grand? Mm-hmm. Idiot. Yeah, Chaldeans, make note. Okay, this is what we're going to come back for in a few years. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoring lust. And after she was defiled by them, she turned from them in disgust. When she carried on her whoring so openly and flaunted her nakedness, I turned in disgust from her as I had turned in disgust from her sister. Yet she increased her whoring, remembering the days of her youth when she played the whore in the land of Egypt and lusted after her lovers there, whose members hmm, whose members were like those of donkeys. Okay, mm. well, descriptive. Mm -hmm. And whose issue was like that of horses. Okay. <laughs> yeah, descriptive. <laughs> Parents, don't read this chapter. <laughs> Mommy, what's that what's mean? What's that mean? They were super donkeys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh, okay. I knew this was in here in Ezekiel somewhere, but I'd forgotten where mm -hmm. in the book it was. And I, I, here I, it is. Yeah, I thought maybe we'd already passed that uh, section. Just remember Ezekiel 23 and me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 23 chromosomes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. well, you know, there are places in Leviticus that you don't want to read with children no, out exactly. loud with children in no. the room either. Yeah, I made that mistake when Nicole was little over breakfast one morning. <laughs> Dad, what does that mean? Uncover his father's nakedness? Um, don't know. Go away. <laughs> yeah, have some cereal. Uh, Eat a lot <clears> of sugar <throat> here, honey. Mm-hmm. Thus you longed for the lewdness of your youth when the Egyptians handled your bosom and pressed your young breasts. Therefore, O Aholabas, thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will stir up against you your lovers from whom you turned in disgust, and I will bring them against you from every side, the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Picad and Shoah and Koah, and all the Assyrians with them, desirable young men, governors and commanders, all of them, officers and men of renown, all of them riding on horses." And interesting, uh, this is sort of the terminology that Ezekiel uses later in chapters 37 or 38 and 39 to describe the, the horde of Magog. Yes, hmm. riding on horses, we see that over and over again, and it's almost always indicative of an invasion. It, of an invasion, right. The kings ride on donkeys, but uh, the the soldiers the ride on horses. The warriors on horses, exactly. Right. Yeah, because the donkeys are too smart for that. They, they've got spears. I'm not going there. Oh. <clears throat> And they shall come against you from the north with chariots and wagons and a host of peoples. And this is prophetic, not just of the invasion from Babylon, which was about to happen. And, and by the way, uh, this uh, section about turning to, um, uh, you know, well, uh, there, there's a historic context in yeah, there, too. This is an already yeah. but not yet. An already but not yet, right. The invasion from the north is a theme that is repeated in the prophets, not just uh, Ezekiel, but uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, and it's for two reasons. One, that geographically speaking, invasions always came from the north because east of Israel, east of Moab and Ammon, is this huge desert, the Syrian desert. You don't march an army across that desert unless you want all your soldiers to die. Um, it's uh, Anbar province of Iraq today, basically. Uh, it's, it's a wasteland. The only people there are what's left of the Islamic State because nobody wants to chase them into that desert. Um, 
so they would follow the Euphrates north, turn left on the caravan trail that went through Palmyra, and then come down from Damascus along the mountains. But it's more than just the geographic north. Uh, the, the spiritual north, the supernatural north, is where the enemies lie, because Mount Hermon was to the north. Uh, Carmel, which was a mountain that was uh, used for Baal worship, mm -hmm. uh, was... During the time of Ezekiel, uh, th that was sort of like the borderline between uh, Israel or the territory of Israel and Judah and the Phoenicians. And, of course, uh, Mount Zephon, which mm -hmm. means north. Uh, and, and I just spot a scholar just pointed out in, in a paper I found the other day that um, Hebrew is, is one of the Semitic languages related sort of to Amorite and Akkadian. But mm -hmm. uh, in those languages, north is always the word simal, which means left. Because as you face the sun, it's on your left. But in Hebrew, Mount Zaphon, the mountain of Baal, was so important that Zaphon replaced Simal as the name of the compass point north. Yeah, I want to stop really briefly, though, because if you look in the original Masoretic text, mm -hmm. the, it's uh, Bo al Hotsen Rekeb, Rekev. They will come against you with weapons, chariots and wagons, and with a company of peoples. North is not in here. Hmm. And if you look in, in the explanation for the ESV, it says Septuagint puts in something that may mean from the north. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, you're right. It says the, uh, yeah, the, the word comes uh, north was taken from the Septuagint. So the Jewish translators in the third century BC trying to, interpret the Hebrew, and again, this gets to, you know, the use of archaic terms, mm -hmm. um, shows kind of what was in their mind and their, the doctrines that they had been taught. Well, it must mean north because the, and this is the point I've been making, the enemy always comes from the north, whether it's a physical enemy like the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the spiritual north, whether it's El or Melkart or Baal or whomever, they come from those places in the north where we know the gods assemble. Right. I want to go to the Septuagint really quickly and see what it says here. Uh, what's the verse again? It's verse 24. Ezekiel um, 23, 24 is what we're looking at here. And they shall, and they all shall come upon thee from the north, chariots and wheels with a multitude of nations, shields and targets, and the enemy shall set a watch. Yeah, it does have something in here. What What is in the original um, Greek? Don't know. Don't I don't read Greek, so. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking at the Benton translation of it, and, and of course the Greek was what the uh, Septuagint w translators produced from, yes, from the, exactly. he, from the Hebrew texts that were available to them, right. which sadly we don't have access to because anymore. Because at the time, Greek was the language, the lingua franca, mm -hmm. in some ways. After Alexander the Great yeah. conquered the yeah the whole Near East, um, so anyway, yeah, this is uh, indicates a couple of things. First of all, what uh, the, the Septuagint the minds, translators yeah. of what was in their minds, and they because again they understood that the enemy always comes out of the north, mm -hmm. and we see that again reflected in Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine. Yeah, the uttermost parts of the north, yeah. pointing to Mount Zaphon, the holy mountain of Baal. Uh, and they shall come against you from the north with chariots and wagons and a host of peoples. They shall set themselves against you on every side with buckler, shield, and helmet. Now, buckler, we think of as a belt buckle, but that's not quite what that word means. No, it's a barbed hook. It can also mean a very large shield. Uh, but in this case, since we see the word shield already, mm -hmm. it probably, this is a, a, an offensive weapon. Yeah. Which likely is used to, you know, pull guys down off the wall. Yeah. 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 Also interesting that we get the term host of peoples. So this is a confederation. Mm-hmm. They shall set themselves against you on every side with buckler, shield, and helmet, and I will commit the judgment to them. And they shall judge you according to their judgments. In other words, I'm done with you. Let the Babylonians have you. Mm -hmm. And I will direct my jealousy against you that they may deal with you in fury. They shall cut off your nose and your ears and your survivors shall fall by the sword. They shall seize your sons and your daughters and your survivors shall be devoured by fire. They shall also strip you of your clothes and take away your beautiful jewels. Thus, I will put an end to your lewdness and your whoring begun in the land of Egypt so that you shall not lift up your eyes to them or remember Egypt any more. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will deliver you into the hands of those whom you hate, into the hands of those from whom you turned in disgust, and they shall deal with you in hatred, and take away all the fruit of your labor, and leave you naked and bare, and the nakedness of your whoring shall be uncovered. Your lewdness and your whoring have brought this upon you, because you played the whore with the nations and defiled yourself with their idols. And that's the key point here. He's not talking about sexual impropriety. Although exactly. that may be part of it, because some of the worship of these 
false gods required that. Sexual impropriety. Exactly. But the point is that it's a spiritual unfaithfulness. Mm Mm-hmm. Your lewdness and your whoring have brought this upon you because you played the whore with the nations and defiled yourself with their idols. You have gone the way of your sister. Therefore, I will give her up her cup. Rather, I will give her cup into your hand. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, you shall drink your sister's cup that is deep and large. You shall be laughed at and held in derision for it contains much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, a cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You shall drink it and drain it out and gnaw its shards and tear your breasts. For I have spoken, declares the Lord Yahweh. Therefore, thus says the Lord Yahweh, because you have forgotten me and cast cast me behind your back, you yourself must bear the consequences of your lewdness and whoring. Yahweh said to me, son of man, will you judge Ohola and Aholabah? Declare to them their abominations. For they have, committed adul- they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. With their idols they have committed adultery, and they have even offered up to them the food. Or made back, to pass back through the fire. They have offered up to them for food. Yeah, again, this is word for word into English, so it's uh, not constructed the same way necessarily an English speaker would. But yeah, this is this is a reference that uh, child sacrifice of uh, gods like Molech and Baal Hamon, right. uh, so forth. And they have even offered up to them for food the children whom they had borne to me. Let me read that verse again, verse 37. For they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. With their idols they have committed adultery, and they have even offered up to them for food the children whom they had borne to me. You and I, I think we did a Sci Friday on this where we talked about the, the, the pillar that had the four sides and the yes. various bas-relief imagery that was on it, yeah. and one of them showed very clear representation of child sacrifice, right. and it's this horrendous uh, chimeric creature right. who's eating from a bowl that clearly has a child in it. Yeah, it's uh, Pozo Moro, P-O-Z-O-M-O-R-O. Uh, I make reference to that in the forthcoming book, and you're right, these monsters are clearly eating, well, little bowl there, you've got little legs sticking out, it's mm-hmm. pretty clear what those things are. Um, this is, uh, from a Phoenician site in Spain and, uh, dates to about the fifth, sixth century BC. So a couple hundred years after, well, no, actually about the same time as Ezekiel's writing. Yeah. The Phoenicians who were descendants of the Amorites, worshipers of Molech and, uh, 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 Chemosh, yeah, uh, so it gives they, you an idea of what they were doing. Exactly. And, and so this is the type of thing that God was condemning them for, uh, because the Phoenicians had spread out, uh, to basically cover the whole Mediterranean. And, uh, you know, L.A. Marzulli and others believe that they actually spread to the Americas. Yeah, and we're going to be taking a look at the island of Sardinia to see how that connects. There are a number of Phoenician tophets on mm-hmm. Sardinia, yeah. Okay. Um, 38. Verse 38. Moreover, this they have done to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day and profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slaughtered their children in sacrifice to their idols... On the same day, they came into my sanctuary to profane it. Let's go sacrifice down in the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, and then we'll go to the temple. Yeah. Mm. We'll hedge all our bets. Mm Mm-hmm. And behold, this is what they did in my house. They even sent for men to come from afar, to whom a messenger was sent. And behold, they came. For them you bathed yourself, painted your eyes, and adorned yourself with ornaments. wonder if this is... uh, a reference back to Hezekiah calling the uh, ambassador from Babylon and showing him around the temple. Possibly. Shouldn't have been allowed in. You sat on a stately couch with a table spread before it on which you had placed my incense and my oil. The sound of a carefree multitude was with her and with men of the common sort. Drunkards were brought from the wilderness and they put bracelets on the hands of the women and beautiful crowns on their heads. Then I said of her who was worn out by adultery, now they will continue to use her for a whore, even her. An alternate translation. Uncertain. Uncertain. Hmm. For they have gone into her as men go into a prostitute. Thus they went into Ahola and Aholaba, lewd women. But righteous men shall pass judgment on them with the sentence of adulteresses and with the sentence of women who shed blood because they are adulteresses and blood is on their hands. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, Bring up a vast host against them and make them an object of terror and a plunder. And the host shall stone them and cut them down with their swords. 
They shall kill their sons and their daughters and burn up their houses. Thus, I will put an end to lewdness in the land, that all women may take warning and not commit lewdness as you have done. And they shall return your lewdness upon you, and you shall bear the penalty for your sinful idolatry, and you shall know that I am the Lord Yahweh. That phrase is repeated over and over in this book. And when we get into the prophecies of the uh, the end times, which Gog, Magog, is, is a prophecy of Armageddon, um, that's when he says, and the world shall know that I am Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Ezekiel 24, very specific time here. In the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, we'll have to look that up and see why that specifically... Uh, corresponds what? to January 5th of 587 B.C. Honey, that's your birthday. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so 587 B.C. <laughs> they were celebrating even back then. There are days I feel quite that, almost that old. <laughs> in the ninth yeah. year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of Yahweh came to me. Son of man, write down the name of this day. This very day, the hmm. king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. So we are told exactly when this happened. And bear in mind that Ezekiel was hundreds of miles away near the city of Nippur in uh, what is now central Iraq. Mm. And utter a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, thus says the Lord Yahweh, set on the pot, set it on, pour in water also, put it, it put in it the pieces of meat all the good pieces, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with choice bones. Take the choicest one of the flock, pile the logs under it, or the bones mm, under mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Boil it well. Seethe also its bones in it. Therefore, thus says the Lord Yahweh, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose corrosion is in it, and whose corrosion has not gone out of it, take out of it piece after piece without making any choice. No lot has fallen upon it, is the alternate translation there. Hmm. For the blood she has shed is in her midst. She put it on the bare rock. She did not pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust. This idea of shedding blood, this is if this if this is what I think it means. Mm-hmm. They're uh, cycling, cycling, you know, menstrual blood that was to be covered. Well, um, yeah. Also, when you and sacrificed, in, when you sac, when when you slaughtered an animal, um, you were to you, cover that. You, you're right. Pour the blood out and yeah. cover it. Yeah. So this is out in the open. It's on a bare rock. It's mm-hmm. not covered in any way. In other words, the sins of the city, the sins of the country were were on open display. Yeah. Yeah. For the blood she has shed is in her midst. She put it on the bare rock. She did not pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust. To rouse my wrath to take vengeance, I have set on the bare rock the blood she has shed, that it may not be covered. Therefore, thus says the Lord Yahweh, Woe to the bloody city! I also will make the pile great. Pile hmm. of bodies? Let's see what the original language is here. Uh, the pile, well, the pile of wood for the fire. Yeah, pyre is a better translation yeah, of that yeah, possibly. Yeah. I will make the pyre great, or the pile great. Heap on the logs, kindle the fire, boil the meat well, mix in the spices. Or empty out the broth. Oh, yeah. And let the bones be burned up, which calls back to the previous alternate translation of Mm -hmm. logs under the fire to, uh, to burning the bones. Then set it empty upon the coals that it may become hot and its copper may burn that its uncleanness may be melted in it, its corrosion consumed. She has wearied herself with toil. Its abundant corrosion does not go out of it into the fire with its corrosion. On account of your unclean lewdness, because I would have cleansed you and you were not cleansed from your uncleanness, you shall not be cleansed any more till I have satisfied my fury upon you. I am Yahweh. I have spoken. It shall come to pass. 
I will do it. I will not turn back. I will not spare. I will not relent according to your ways and your deeds. You will be judged, declares the Lord Yahweh. Can't make it much more clear mm-hmm. than That's that. It's pretty plain, yeah. The word of Yahweh came to me. Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your uh, your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. Hmm. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening... My wife died, and on the next morning I did as I was commanded. That had to have been really hard. You would think. And the people said to me, Will you not tell us what these things mean for us, that you are acting thus? Hmm. In other words, why aren't you mourning? What's your problem? Then I said to them, The word of Yahweh came to me. Say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, and the yearning of your soul, and your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. And you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips nor eat the bread of men. Your turbans shall be on your heads and your shoes on your feet. You shall not mourn or weep, but you shall rot away in your iniquities, and groan to one another. Thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes, then you will know that I am the Lord Yahweh. As for you, son of man, surely on the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes and their soul's desire, and also their sons and daughters, on that day a fugitive will come to you to report to you the news. On that day your mouth will be opened to the fugitive, and you shall speak and be no longer mute. So you will be a sign to them, and they will know that I am Yahweh. Hmm. Ezekiel 25, now he begins with a series of prophecies against the uh, nearby neighbors of, uh, of Judah. Uh, this is, uh, you know, these, these could have been allies with, with the Judeans against the uh, impending destruction of Babylon, but uh, it appears that they weren't. Ammon was uh, the child of Lot, wasn't mm-hmm. he? Yeah, so uh, Ammon and, and Moab both. Mm-hmm. Um, and they occupied the territory east of the Jordan River. Yeah, children he had with his daughters. Yeah, mm, nice. Uh, Ezekiel 25, The word of Yahweh came to me, Son of man, set your face toward the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord Yahweh. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, because you said, Aha, over my sanctuary when it was profaned, and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate. That was when the Assyrians captured it in 722 B.C., which was about 140 years before Ezekiel wrote. And over the house of Judah when they went into exile, therefore behold, I am handing you over to the people of the east for a possession. That's Babylon's are, Babylonians are coming, or the Chaldeans are coming from mm-hmm. Babylon, and uh, they're going to take the Ammonites away as well. Uh, and pretty much at this point in history, this is about the time that Ammon, Moab, and Edom disappear from history. Uh, let's see. Uh, Therefore, behold, I'm handing you over to the people of the east for a possession, and they shall set their encampments among you and make their dwellings in your midst. They shall eat your fruit, and they shall drink your milk. I will make Rabbah a pasture for camels, and Ammon a fold for flocks. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, Because you have clapped your hands and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all the malice within your soul against the land of Israel, therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you and will hand you over as plunder to the nations, and I will cut you off from the peoples and will make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, because Moab and Seir, and that's... uh, 
Edom. Because Moab and Seir said, Behold, the house of Judah is like all the other nations. Therefore I will lay open the flank of Moab from the cities, from its cities on its frontier, the glory of the country, Beth Jeshemoth, Baal Meon, and Kiriathem. I will give it along with the Ammonites to the people of the east as a possession, that the Ammonites may be remembered no more among the nations. And I will execute judgments upon Moab. Then they will know that I am Yahweh. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and is grievously offended in taking vengeance on them, therefore thus says the Lord Yahweh, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from it man and beast. And I will make it desolate, from Timon even to Didan, which is the same name, by the way, as Dayton. yeah, Dathan. It's this. It's the same. The, the origin of this name goes all the way back to uh, uh, the ancient Akkadians, but the Greeks used this name for the old gods, the Titans. Mm-hmm. From Timon even to Didan, they shall fall by the sword. These are references to uh, oases in the, uh, the desert of uh, Arabia. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath, and they shall know my vengeance, declares the Lord Yahweh. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy in never-ending enmity. Therefore thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, and I will cut off the Carathites and destroy the rest of the seacoast. A uh, Carathite is a reference to a people from the uh, island of Crete. It will, I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am Yahweh when I lay my vengeance upon them. Chapter 26. In the eleventh year, on the first day of the month, the word of Yahweh came to me, Son of man, because Tyre said concerning Jerusalem, Aha! The gate of the peoples is broken. It has swung open to me. I shall be replenished now that she is laid waste. Therefore thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and will bring up many nations against you as the sea brings up its waves. Oh, that's picture. Mm -hmm. The sea coming up against Tyre. Yeah. The sea representing the abyss. In, yes, uh, I know, but that's imagery. really interesting yeah. when you take uh, 27 and 28 into account. Mm-hmm. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre. Excuse me, my nose is running, so if you hear rustling, it's my tissue. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her soil from her and make her a bare rock. Yeah, this was uh, prophesying the uh, destruction by Alexander the Great. Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Tyre, um, I think 13 years, if I remember right, but uh, could not take the city because he didn't have a fleet. Mm-hmm. And um, But this is setting up, like I said, 27 and 28. So it, I think it's more than just... Tyre. Yeah, yeah. Could be an already, but not yet, and not yet again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the threefold. <laughs> yes. She shall be in the midst of the sea, a place for the spreading of nets. For I have spoken, declares the Lord Yahweh. And she shall become plunder for the nations, and her daughters on the mainland shall be killed by the sword. Yeah. They will know that I am Yahweh. Mm-hmm. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings, with horses and chariots, and with horsemen and a host of many soldiers." Interesting that the king of Babylon was called king of kings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because he was essentially the world dominar. Yes. <laughs> he will kill with the sword your daughters on the mainland. He will set up a siege wall against you and throw up a mound against you and raise a roof of shields against you. He will direct the shock of his battering rams against your walls, and with his axes he will break down your towers. His horses will be so many that their dust will cover you. That's a lot of horses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen and wagons and chariots when he enters your gates as men enter a city that has been breached. 
With the hoofs of the horse of his horses, he will trample all your streets. He will kill your people with the sword, and your mighty pillars will fall to the ground. Mighty pillars, probably idols, but also possibly, possibly. pillars of buildings. Mm-hmm. They will plunder your riches and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. Your stones and timber and soil, they will cast into the midst of the waters. And I will stop the music of your songs. And the sound of your lyres shall be heard no more. I will make you a bare rock. You shall be a place for the spreading of nets. You shall never be rebuilt, for I am Yahweh. I have spoken, declares the Lord Yahweh. Thus says the Lord Yahweh to Tyre, Will not your will not the coastlands shake at the sound of your fall when the wounded groan, when slaughter is made in your midst? Then all the princes of the sea will step down from their thrones and remove their robes and strip off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground and tremble every moment and be appalled at you. And they will raise a lamentation over you and say to you, Have you, how you have perished. This is parallel to the whale for Babylon. Yes, and uh, you you see that again in in Ezekiel 27. And I'm Mm -hmm. looking at this too and realize I I overlooked this section of Ezekiel 26. So I need to make reference to that in the book. Um, The... uh, just stepping back a sec- section, uh, verses fifteen through seventeen, the uh, the princes of the the sea, uh, Tyre was the most powerful of the Phoenician uh, kingdoms, and it it emerged as the main city state on the the coast after the sea peoples came through about five hundred years earlier. Ugarit, which was further north, had been the uh, the most powerful of those uh, sea coast kingdoms in. Uh, you know Lebanon and Syria, but uh, the the Sea Peoples, the Philistines, and uh, their allied uh, uh, peoples who, who uh, at the end of the Bronze Age, swept down from what is now Turkey and uh, basically destroyed the Hittite Empire, and then destroyed most of the states in what is now Lebanon and Syria. Um, when they rebuilt, Tyre emerged as the most powerful, mm-hmm. but it, it sent out these colonies all throughout the Mediterranean, including Sardinia, which is mm-hmm. why we mentioned it earlier. But Carthage was the biggest and the most famous. Mm-hmm. And it was about this time that Carthage, which had been sending tithes back to Tyre, uh, emerged as an independent state on its own and just kind of broke ranks with Tyre. The The chief god of Tyre, as we mentioned in the uh, First Kings, uh, the confrontation between Elijah mm-hmm. and uh, the prophets of um, uh, of Baal was actually Melkart, um, which AKA yeah Hercules Heracles uh-huh. to the Greeks. Um, the uh, the Carthaginians chose as their chief god Baal Hamon, who was Kronos, the king of the Titans, who was El of the Canaanites. Uh, so there there was some differences between them, but yeah, at this point you, you're looking at uh, until Nebuchadnezzar essentially. Uh, hamstrung Tyre. Alexander finally destroyed it a couple hundred years later. Uh, but Nebuchadnezzar, um, they, they finally, the Tyrians finally sued for peace and the royal house was deported. So they, they were basically um, you know, made, made an unimportant city at that point. Uh, and, that, and that's where the, the princes of the Phoenicians who had set up all these colonies around the Mediterranean and what is now Greece and Spain and North Africa were freaking out that their home city was suddenly being you know, <laughs> attacked by Babylon. Um, I'll go back to 16. Then all the princes of the sea will step down from their thrones and remove their robes and strip off their embroidered garments. Mm -hmm. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground and tremble every moment and be appalled at you. And they will raise a lamentation over you and say to you, how you have perished, you who were inhabited from the seas. O city renowned who was mighty on the sea, she and her inhabitants imposed their terror on all her inhabitants. Now the coastlands tremble on the day of your fall, and the coastlands that are on the sea are dismayed at your passing. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, when I made you a city laid waste, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep over you, 
and the great waters cover you. Then I will make you go down with those who go down to the pit, mm. to the people of old. And I will make you to dwell in the world below. The people of old. Yes. Olam. That's yeah. Right. Meaning yes. that means everlasting, long time, eternity, old as in ancient of days kind of old. Here's That's the, the thing. Word. And I will make you to dwell in the world below mm-hmm. among ruins from of old hmm. with those who go down to the pit so that you will not be inhabited, but I will set beauty in the land of the living. That verse, 2620, is really interesting. Yeah. I will make you go down with those who go down to the pit, to the people to the people of old, and I will make you to dwell in the world below among ruins from of old. Huh. Isn't that really fascinating? There's an idea there that there is uh, yeah, interaction between the... the like the ancient waste places. Yeah. Is it the other translation? Huh. Is this a reference offhand to the uh the men of renown? I would say so. Might even be a reference to what we would call Atlantis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not that Atlantis existed in the no, way no, it was no, remembered no, by no. by Homer, but uh uh but still the, there there were legends of a world that existed before the flood. That's exactly what I'm saying. A yes, pre-flood world, exactly. what we would call Atlantis. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, or Avalonia. <laughs> <laughs> I will bring you to I will bring you to a dreadful end, and you shall be no more, though you be sought for Atlantis. Mm, yes, yes. You will never be found again, declares the Lord Yahweh. Oh yeah, that okay. All right. That's going in, 20 and 21. Yeah, but you, we could do a whole another book on that, and that's maybe an idea for a future book. You're right. This is a, a, an already, but not yet, because while Nebuchadnezzar reduced Tyre from being the most powerful city-state in the Mediterranean at that point, um, and it wasn't as powerful militarily as Babylon, but the fact that Babylon could not conquer Tyre completely because it didn't have a navy mm-hmm. um, indicates how powerful Tyre actually was the land-based part of the city was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The walls were broken down. The city was razed. People carried off. But the island offshore, about a half mile offshore, was where the elites lived. And they were able to uh, hold off the attack because Nebuchadnezzar couldn't get his army to the island. Alexander actually built a land bridge that you can see to this day by putting rocks. They built a causeway out to the island and was actually did what was prophesied here by scraping mm-hmm. the rock down to nothing. But there's a there's a, a, a not yet fulfillment, and that's what we get to now in Ezekiel 27. Because exactly. Tyre... Do you ne- I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You need to start this at verse 19, if you're going to re- reference these. Because verse 19 talks about, I yes, will bring yes. up the deep over you. That's to home. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Is that really? Yeah, I just looked it up. Oh, Yes. And to home is significant because, as we've talked about back in Genesis 1, verse 2, to home is a cognate for the Akkadian word temtum, which was their name for Tiamat, the chaos god, chaos yes. dragon, Leviathan. Yes, exactly. Ding, 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 ding. Huh. Okay. Well, yeah, I got a whole other book idea in that uh, this, this section right here. Uh, because, again, Tyre is a symbol of uh, something... Um, in the end times, and John picks up on that, and we'll we'll get into exactly why that is now. We'll start again at verse 19 of chapter 26, and then roll into chapter 27. For thus says the Lord Yahweh, when I make you a city laid waste like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring up the deep, the chaos monster, over you, and the great waters cover you, then I will make you to go down with those who go down to the pit, the abyss, Tartarus. Mm-hmm. which is where, <laughs> to the people of old, the Titans, mm-hmm. the Watchers, one and the same, by the way, and I will make you to dwell in the world below among ruins from of old with those who go down to the pit so that you will not be inhabited, but I will set beauty in the land of the living. I will bring you to a dreadful end and you shall be no more. Though you be sought for, you will never be found again, declares the Lord Yahweh. And keep this in mind, we're not going to get to chapter 28 today because... There's too much there. Oh, there. there's so much there. But there. this relates to chapter 28 as well, which is where Ezekiel 
laments over the king of Tyre, who mm-hmm. he equates to the rebel from Eden. Chapter 27 now. The word of Yahweh came to me. Now you, son of man, raise a lamentation over Tyre and say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrances to the sea, merchant of the peoples to many coastlands, thus says the Lord Yahweh. And by the way, the entrances to the sea is also significant because the chief Canaanite god El, or their creator god, they believed, El, who was Kronos, the leader of the Titans, which, because the Titans are the Watchers, would make him Shemiaza, the leader of the oh, Watchers yeah. who descended at Mount Hermon. Uh, El's abode was believed to be at the the um, the place that they called of the, the Double Deep, mm-hmm. the heart of the seas, in other words. So that's what is being referred to here. And that's the point. Tyre is being used as an example of something. Remember, the Phoenicians were descendants of the Amorites. Mm-hmm. The Amorites founded Babylon and the occult system that is, well... It's all about it's the sin of the Amorites. Right. Prophetic significance. The word of Yahweh came to me. Now you, son of man, raise a lamentation over Tyre and say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrances to the sea... Yeah, I'm going to make a note of that too. 27 verse. <laughs> Merchant of the peoples to many coastlands, thus says the Lord Yahweh. O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Now, who says that? Yeah, we see that in chapter yeah. 28, which again, you'll have to wait three weeks for that. Um, your borders are in the heart of the seas, mm-hmm. like the abode of El yes. slash Kronos. Your builders made perfect your beauty. Okay, well, who was created perfect in beauty? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They made all your planks of fir trees from Sinir. Now, this is significant because Sinir was the Amorite name for Mount Hermon. But by this point in history, 6th century BC, the Amorites, at least under the name Amorite, had faded from history. They basically disappeared from history under that name after the conquest. Mm-hmm. So it had been about mm, 700 years since the Amorites were considered a thing. Yeah. Mind you, this imagery is of a ship. Yes. Um, this is the, 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 uh, an, an image of the, the source of, of Tyre's power, which was economic. Mm-hmm. And so the trading ships, the merchant ships that, uh, uh, that gave Tyre its power are being connected to Sinir. Now, why did he use the Amorite name for the mountain, though? That's the thing. Why didn't he call it Mount Hermon? Yes, Exactly. And when you look back in history, we talked about the chronological order in, in which we're, we're reading these scriptures. When you go back in history before Ezekiel writing in the 580s BC, the previous reference to Sinir under that name was in Song of Solomon 400 years earlier. Oh, yes, that's right. This is an archaic term. Yeah. So, you know, how many place names here in the United States have the same name that they did 400 years ago? Not many. A few, but not many. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make a mast for you. Lebanon, of course, is the location of Sinir, Hermon. You know, fir trees and cedars, these trees from this forest of Mount Hermon, Mm -hmm. reminds me of Gilgamesh. Yes, it does. And, yeah, right, the Gilgamesh epic when uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu had to go destroy the... uh, They they went to make a name for themselves by killing the guardian of the cedar forest, which was in Lebanon. Yes, yes. rabbit trailing uh the guardian was named humbaba but it could also be vocalized huwawa and uh, david livingston who's the founder of associates for biblical research uh he's an archaeologist he's passed away now argued that huwawa might have been a mesopotamian transliteration of yahweh oh that's very strange yeah so gilgamesh went to kill yahweh on mount hermon oh that's really interesting possibly possibly now, he, we don't know that that's what it actually means, but, right. he, but it's, yeah. Yeah, he's, there aren't many scholars who subscribe to that, but uh, you know, Dr. Livingston made that uh, hmm. you know, observation. But um, when Gilgamesh and Enkidu went to kill Humbaba, the, the text from the old Babylonian text, or copy of the Gilgamesh epic, which from about the time of Abraham, said they, they penetrated the secret dwelling of the Anunnaki. That's significant because the old gods of the Sumerians, who had been the chief gods of Sumer, by the time of Abraham, 
were considered gods of the underworld. Mm-hmm. They had been demoted. Yes. It's another retelling of the Titan epic where they get were overthrown, demoted, sent to the underworld. The um, very thing we talked about on Sci Friday this exactly. week. Exactly. The Watchers being condemned to the underworld. Same thing over and over it's again. It's rebellions all the way down. Exactly. They made your planks of fir trees from Sinir. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make a mast for you. Of oaks of Bashan, oh, they yeah. made your oars. Mm-hmm. Again, he's connecting the source of Tyre's wealth and power to the Amorites. To the Amorites and to that specific spiritual location, Mount Hermon, the abode of the underworld gods, the Anunnaki of El, where he lived with his 70 sons, the gods of the nations. They made your decks, oh, the deck of pines from the coasts of Cyprus. Cyprus colonized by Amorites, inlaid with ivory. A fine embroidered linen from Egypt was your sail. Little call back there to the Egyptians. Shout out to our homies in, uh, in Egypt was your sail serving as your banner. But during the exodus, or during the sojourn in northern Egypt, the, <laughs> Egypt was ruled by Amorites. Amorites. A fine embroidered linen from Egypt was your sail, serving as your banner, blue and purple from the coasts of Elisha. That's uh, Crete, I believe. So he's essentially saying all of these are Amorite. Uh, yes. Oh, the, well, the coast of Elisha. Elisha is another name for Cyprus. Right? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, the inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad were your rowers. Sidon was another Phoenician city, so was Arvad. Your skilled men, O Tyre, were in you. They were your pilots. The elders of Gibal, another Phoenician coastal city, and her skilled men were in you, caulking your seams. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in you to barter for your wares. In other words, this is a an Amorite venture, and the means by which they gathered together to to uh, uh, you know, build up their power and their, their came from the uh, the resources that they derived from Hermon mm-hmm. and Bashan, which was the the entrance to the underworld this in their is religion. This worldwide cr- commerce rooted in the Amorite worship. Of the gods of the dead, yes, essentially. Exactly. The old gods, yeah. Persia and Lud and Put, that's uh, Libya and, uh, well, wait, Lud is Lydia, that's uh, Asia Minor, that's uh, modern day Turkey. Mm-hmm. Uh, Put is um, Ethiopia. We're in your army as your men of war. They hung the shield and helmet in you. They gave you splendor. Men of Arvad and Helech were on your walls all around, and men of Gamad were in your towers. And uh, those are cities, Helech and Gamad, that we have not been identified by scholars. They hung your shields on your walls all around. They made perfect... Gamadim are are just brave men, or valorous men. Mm, Okay. Uh hung their shields on your walls all around, they made perfect your beauty. Tarshish did business with you because of your great wealth of every kind. Tarshish, uh, a kind of a, almost a a legendary city for its wealth and trading. We see uh, the merchants of Tarshish mentioned several times in the Bible. Uh, There are some who believe that this is um, Tiras, T-I-R-A-S, who was mentioned as one of the sons of uh, Javan in uh, the book of Genesis. Javan was the uh, progenitor of the Greeks. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, some believe that this was a reference to the Etruscans, hmm. who f- settled in uh, Italy before the Romans. Tarshish did business with you because of your great wealth of every kind. Silver, iron, tin, and lead they exchanged for your wares. Javan, Greece, Tubal, and Meshek traded with you. Uh, Tubal and Meshek are mentioned later in Ezekiel 38. They're part of the coalition that comes against uh, um, Israel. And they're in Turkey. They're in Turkey, Right. The uh, Meshech was a people group called the uh, the Mushki in Assyrian records, and their most mm-hmm. famous king was named Midas. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. They traded with you. They exchanged human beings and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. Tubal, by the way, is about where modern-day Armenia is. From Beth Togarma, which is also in that region near um, Armenia, they exchanged horses, war horses, and mules for your wares. The men of Didan traded with you. That's uh, the western side of Saudi Arabia. There's Rhodes a, is what the Septuagint says. Uh, mm, no. No, not a... I not think a, the Greeks would have known to how to pronounce, uh, to, to translate Didon, but well, maybe y- they misunderstood. Well, it could be, yeah. Um, the Hebrew, though, is, is definitely a reference to Didon, and Didon was a... Uh, actually, a, there was a country, a, a little kingdom there that uh, in the... In the uh, A.D. period, like 2nd, 3rd century A.D., lasted for a few hundred years um, 
around this uh, oasis in, in Western Arabia. Along, it's on the Spice Road. South Arabia. Yeah, the spice must flow. <laughs> Uh, and they were very wealthy. Control of that spice trade was was very important. The men of Didan traded with you. Many coastlands were your own special markets. They brought in you in payment ivory tusks and ebony. Syria did business with you because of your abundant goods. They exchanged for your wares emeralds, purple embroidered work, fine linen, coral, and ruby. Judah and the land of Israel traded with you. They exchanged for your merchandise wheat of minneth, meal, honey, oil, and balm. Uncertain. Yeah. Damascus did business with you for your abundant goods because of your great wealth of every kind. Wine of Helbon and wool of Sahar. Sahar is an, uh, I think that's a familiar name, but I don't, it's not coming to mind. And casks of wine from Uzal, they exchanged for your wares. As in the Sahara Desert? Is that why it looks familiar? Um, maybe, but um, I think I was confusing it with the name of the uh, god of dawn, Shahar. Oh, that could be. And there's, there's a mountain, I think, in central Syria that may have that name, but I don't remember. Uh, casks of wine from Uzal, they exchanged for your wares. Wrought iron. Cassia. Here's what's weird is if you look in the original, mm-hmm. you don't see Sahar in here at all. Because of the wine of Helbon and white wool. Hmm. It doesn't say where it's from in the, uh, the Masoretic text. Okay. I think the Septuagint puts in there. Well, I'm, I'm seeing Hebrew word Sahar, but it just is noun, a pro, just a proper noun. So it's a place, but. The wool of. Wool of Sahar, verse 18. Oh, I see. I see. Sahar. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sahar. It's, uh, it means uh, tawny or reddish gray. Well, there's a lot of that in that part or of the world. Or white. <laughs> Hence being translated white wool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, verse 19, and casks of wine from Uzal, they exchanged for your wares. And Uzal, is that the land of Uz where Job lived? Mm. Anyway, anyway, uh, they exchanged for your wares. Well, the word is actually Uzal. I have, I shall be flooded. <laughs> mm. Sixth son of Joktan. Okay. Well, the land of Uz where um, Job lived was in that part of the Transjordan. Mm-hmm. So it would have been relatively close to Damascus. These are a lot of tribe names. Yeah, yeah. They exchanged for your wares. Wrought iron, cassia, and calamus were bartered for your merchandise. Didan traded with you in saddlecloths for riding. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar, that's uh, the northern part of the Arabian desert there, were your favored dealers in lambs, rams, and goats. In these, they did business with you. The traders of Sheba and Ra'ama traded with you. They exchanged for your wares the best of all kinds of spices and all precious stones and gold. Haran, that's uh, where... Abraham was called from, mm-hmm. one of the centers of the uh, the moon god cult. Cana, Eden, traders of Sheba, Asher, and Kilmad traded with you. In your market, these traded with you in choice garments, in clothes of blue and embroidered work, and in carpets of colored material bound with cords and made secure. The ships of Tarshish traveled for you with your merchandise, so you were filled and heavily laden in the heart of the seas. Your rowers, and, and this is where we get into the section that John uh, echoes in the book of Revelation, Revelation 18. Your rowers have brought you out into the high seas. The east wind has wrecked you in the heart of the seas. East, by the way, the direction of the entrance to Eden, also the entrance to the temple. This is God destroying Tyre and the future prophesied Tyre. And it's getting wrecked in the heart of Yom. Yes. Yom being the Canaanite sea god, which represents, again, chaos, mm-hmm. the abyss. Um, and the heart of the seas being a reference to the abode of El. Yes. Just, uh, another reference to that. The east wind has wrecked you in the heart of the seas. Your riches, your wares, your merchandise, your mariners and your pilots, your caulkers, your dealers in merchandise, and all your men of war who are in you with all your crew that is in your midst sink into the heart of the seas on the day of your fall. At the sound of the cry of your pilots, the countryside shakes, and down from their ships come all who handle the oar. The mariners and all the pilots of the sea stand on the land and shout aloud over you and cry out bitterly. They cast dust on their heads and wallow in ashes. They make themselves bald for you and put sackcloth on their waist. And they weep over you in the bitterness of soul with bitter mourning. In their wailing, they raise a lamentation for you and lament over you. Who is like Tyre? Like one destroyed in the midst of the sea. Fallen, fallen, fallen is, is Babylon, Babylon the, the great. great. When your wares came from the seas, you satisfied many peoples. 
With your abundant wealth and merchandise, you enriched the kings of the earth. Now you are wrecked by the seas in the depth of the waters. Your merchandise and all your crew in your midst have sunk with you. All the inhabitants of the coastlands are appalled at you, and the hair of their kings bristles with horror. Their faces are convulsed. The merchants among the peoples hiss at you. You have come to a dreadful end and shall be no more forever. And that is, again, the uh, prophecy of a future date, and a future uh, fulfillment. Yes. And let me just uh, show you, and this is a, this is a little sneak preview of oh, what's coming in August. Peek. Uh, key phrases from Ezekiel 27, which we just read, and Revelation 18, which is the prophecy of the fall of Babylon the Great. Ezekiel 27, 33, we just read, enriched the kings of the earth. Revelation 18, 9, the kings of the earth lived in luxury with her. Ezekiel 27, verses 28 through 30, uh, 36, we basically you see, as we just read, uh, the fall of Tyre is lamented by mariners, the pilots of the sea, merchants, kings. Same thing in Revelation. Chapter uh, 18, verses 9 through 19, you'll see it there when you read through. The fall of Babylon, lamented by kings, merchants, shipmasters, and seafaring men. And then, uh, as we just read, Ezekiel 27, verses 32 and 33. Who was like Tyre, like one destroyed in the midst of the sea? With your abundant wealth and merchandise, you enrich the kings of the earth. And then John writes in Revelation 18, verses 18 and 19. What city was like the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth? It's not a coincidence. John knew Ezekiel. Either he'd read Ezekiel or God showed him the same thing and said, write down the words this way. I'd say at the very least it's the second one, but but I'm sure that he also had read Ezekiel. Yeah. Um, It it definitely, John was inspired. He was writing down what God told him to write down. Mm -hmm. But the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right, right. And the point is that the rebel against God has been the same yesterday and today and in the future. These entities that we've been taught in our churches are imaginary. Oh, how can you say that the gods of the Greeks were real? Because God because said that they were real. The Bible. They're in the Bible. God passed judgment on them, Psalm 82. Uh, that makes ex- me feel oogie. I don't want to hear about that. Oh, yeah. Well, sorry. Like Mike Heiser says, not protecting you against your Bible anymore. <laughs> not protecting you from your Bible anymore. So, um... Yeah, it's not a coincidence that you see these parallels. It's because, uh, as we see here, Ezekiel connecting Tyre to Babylon, and uh, that, when you get to Ezekiel 38 and 39 and see the uh, the parallels there, it makes it really clear that they were seeing the same event. Yep. So, um, yeah, great stuff. And, of course, Ezekiel 28, the next chapter that we will get to, digs into the, the identity of the rebel, Mm-hmm. from Eden, who will be the great end times enemy of God and Israel. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, you're going to have to wait three weeks for that. So yeah, You can do it. Th- this is like, you know, cliffhanger! <laughs> <laughs> As we prepare for our, our trip to Israel, uh, we, we are so looking forward to it because we will see Mount Hermon. We will see some of these megalithic burial tombs. Again, burial tombs. Redundancy, Department of Redundancy. Uh, these megalithic tombs... Uh, Department of Redundancy offices. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we will take as many pictures and uh, as much video as we can to share so that we can be your eyes and ears while we're, while we're there. Um, you know, it's just it's still find it hard to believe that God has opened this door for us to, to do this because this is a, a once-in-a-lifetime thing. It's, it's an amazing amazing opportunity and we are we are truly blessed and hopefully we can share some of the the awe and wonder that we will no doubt feel amen to that and we we really cherish and appreciate your prayers as we get ready to go this week there are lots of things we have to make sure that we you know little boxes that we have to check off right. make sure we did this did this 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 and and of course the flight there and back and, mm-hmm. and just safety as we're there this is a, a this is a once in history event 70th anniversary of Israel's independence on May 14th. And mm-hmm. uh, if all stays according to plan, we will be in Jerusalem on that day. Um, I had read previously that the president was planning to be there because that's the day that the embassy will be open. They are just essentially going to do what you'd suggested Move all the along. Sign. <laughs> yeah, they're moving the sign on the American consulate, which uh, uh, is all that they needed to do, really. Yes. 
Uh, That's all they, you have to do. Yeah, they said the cost of upgrading the security there is about three hundred thousand dollars, as compared to a billion to build a new embassy building. Yeah, so, no reason to do yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good deal, actually. Mm-hmm. We, we save about uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, and Tel Aviv just becomes a consulate. Right. So that's that's what's going to happen. I, I thought the president was going to be there, but I just saw today that he's saying now he might be there, that he had never actually promised to be there. So I must have misunderstood the he, previous He never story. promised. He said he might go. Right. Even early on, he said he might go. And, and so we would love it if he does. But he probably is also talking with them and saying, look, we've got enough security issues right, right. that that day. Please don't come. Mm-hmm. And we've got a lot of tourists coming in. Please don't come and take a right. hotel the, room. The Gilberts after. and the Heisers are coming. Exactly. So, you know, hey, that's, that's all we need. Exactly. There will be American officials there. Um, I know the Treasury Secretary for sure, the new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, mm-hmm. and a number of others. Plus, you know, all kinds of all kinds of tourists, I'm sure, are, are trying to get into Israel now for that, that day. Mm-hmm. Um, again, God kind of opened this door because we had planned on this day months before the uh, – the the move the embassy move was announced so mm-hmm. we we knew that uh, when the we were offered several different sections of days is it let's take that one because that'll fall on that day now, now of course israel, israel which you know celebrates um st- still uses the, uh, lunar the, the the lunar calendar the uh, the hebrew calendar for uh, a lot of its uh, uh, certainly its religious uh, 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 feasts you know the, the feasts of, of yahweh um they already celebrated the 70th back on April 19th mm-hmm. because it was the 5th of ER, which, you know, moves from month to month because yeah. uh, the calendar doesn't fit, doesn't match the solar calendar. But, That's uh, the, way the way the rest of the world is looking at it. Right. To them, it's May 14th. Yeah. So pretty cool. In fact, cool. that's officially Jerusalem Day over there. So. Exactly. You know, hey, if you're an Israeli, you get to celebrate it twice. Yeah. Who doesn't love that? Exactly. So we're, we, yes, your, your prayers and, and prayers for our, our docs and Sam because he's going to be, he, he loves spending time with the groomer. Uh, which is uh, she, she'll watch him when we go out of town. He gets really excited when he sees us start to pack our bags because it means he gets to go visit his friends Gracie and Copper. Um, and Aunt Eileen. And, you know, Aunt Eileen, who's, uh, you know, knows the dachshund mentality. But uh, this the, three weeks apart, this will be the longest that we've been away from him. Yeah. So uh, your prayers for Sam. Um, appreciate it as well. Father, we thank you for bringing us together over your word and for the amazing, amazing levels of meaning that, uh, that that are in your word we'll never fully understand but lord we just pray that uh, you'll open our minds and grant us wisdom to understand to the best of our ability and please lord we ask that you help us not to add anything to your word or take anything away from it help us not to impose our own worldview our own understanding onto your word and uh, father we just pray that uh, as we Take these weeks to to visit the land where you walked when you were among us as as a man for your protection over the uh, the group that is uh, will be gathering and flying there with us and that you will bless the time that we spend and help the Lord to deepen our faith. We pray, Father, for your blessing on those who are doing the hard work, the the hand-to-hand combat, Lord, in the spirit realm. The missionaries who are taking the gospel to the ends of the world, ends of the earth, to those who are ministering to the broken in spirit, the broken in body, those who are struggling financially, emotionally, Lord, we ask for your spirit to comfort and protect. Father, we ask for your blessing, and we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, until we're back from the Holy Land, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.